From the late Universalist minister, the Reverend Gordon, Gordon McKeeman. Whenever there is a meeting that summons us to our better selves, whenever lostness is found, our fragments are united, our wounds begin healing, or our spines stiffen and our muscles grow strong for the task, there, there is ministry. Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria. Welcome to you, old friends and new, young and old. I'm the Reverend Jennifer Innes, and it is my joy to serve as the minister with this congregation. Whether today is your first Sunday or your thousandth Sunday, you can count that up later. Where, however many Sundays, you have been in our midst. We are stronger because you are with us. We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, sexualities, genders, races, colors, configurations. We are all growing and learning, all loved, just as you are. You are welcome here. Part of our practice includes recognizing the deep threads of connection between each other and the earth. And so this is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They aided the European settlers who came down the Illinois River. We offer our respect and regard to the ancestors of the Peoria people and to who they are today. And now I want to turn toward generosity and gratitude in our liberal religious tradition, it is the members and friends who bring to life the mission and the ministries of each congregation, including and especially ours. The skill and the care and the financial gifts make it possible to be a community that serves all ages and to have done this for a very long time. So join me in being part of this good work. Join me in making a generous financial commitment to the life and ongoing ministries of this congregation. Donations can be received in the plates at the back of the sanctuary, but also online and by mail. I want you to check out the link in the chat if you are online. And thank you. Thank you for every gift, because truly every gift is part of what helps make us be together, helps make us prepare for Prepare for this moment and also prepare for all those who will come to us. I want to take a moment and shift to acknowledge the war in Ukraine that started on Thursday when the Russians started to attack. We offer our solidarity with the Ukrainian people and we will have a longer moment of prayer for all of this heartbreak later in the service. For now, let us recall how much we are lifted in love. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join me for our opening hymn with Leah Morris and Carl Karush, Lifted in Love. 
We are here to be lifted in love. Look at the birds they tell us. We are here to be lifted in love. Look at the trees they tell us We're here to be lifted in love To listen to love As a flower raises its face To the sun we are all one Here to be lifted in grace and love We are here to be lifted in love Look at the sky, it tells us We are here to be lifted in love Look at the trees, they tell us We're here to be lifted in love To listen to love As the children raise all their faces to the sun We are all one Here to be lifted Our opening words this morning are entitled, The Heart of Our Faith, by Reverend Monica Jacobson Tennyson. What is it that calls you here, that calls you onward, that calls you inward, that leads you homeward? What is it that gives you power to make that change, to ask that question, to take that journey? What is it that says you've done well, that asks you to learn more, that brings you to stillness, that holds you up in hard times? It is relationship, the beating heart of our faith. It begins when we share this hour, our truths, this air, our hearts, Come, let us worship together. From the Reverend Sarah Lawal. Out of the flames of fear, we rise with courage of our deepest convictions to stand for justice, inclusion, and peace. Out of the flames of scrutiny, we rise to proclaim our faith with hope to heal a fractured and hurting world. Out of the flames of doubt, we rise to embrace the mystery, the wonder, the awe of all there is and all that is yet to be. Out of the flames of hate, we rise with the force of love, love that celebrates our shared humanity. Out of the flames, we rise. We enter into music in this spirit with the hymn to mercy, pity, peace, and love. To mercy, pity, peace, and love, all pray in their distress, and to those virtues all delight, Return their thankfulness for me. 
Good morning. Today I'd like to take you all on an imaginary walk, just to take a break from this world and slowly wander. A walk in the woods isn't a race after all. It's not about seeing how fast you can go or how quickly you can get to the end of the trail. If you are in too big a hurry or too big a worry, you forget to hear the birds sing and see that little mushroom growing under the tree. But even when you take your time, a walk can be tough sometimes. What if it starts to rain? And what if there's a wet, soggy, boggy place where the stepping stones are few and far between? Well, in those cases, I found a couple things that help. First of all, it helps to have a friend or two along, because then, even if it starts to pour and the raindrops are trickling down your nose, you can always sing a song together, and it's hard to feel sorry for yourself when you're singing. And if you don't have a friend along, there's nothing like a walking stick, which helps you keep your balance and makes you a little steadier on your legs. Actually, walking sticks make me think about our faith, Unitarian Universalism, which is a little different from other religions because for us, life is a lot like a long walk. It takes a beginning when we're little and we're just learning about the world. And then with each step, we're gathering more information and gaining more experiences, finding out about ourselves. And as we explore, what we believe changes. The things that we imagine when we're six years old are different from the dreams we have when we're 60. And none of us is certain where or how the trail ends or what we'll find at its end. But we know that other people have walked this way before, and that gives us the hope and courage to continue on the adventure. Now, just like on a long trail, life sometimes gets a little tough and scary. At times we might start to lose our balance and begin to fall down. That's why it helps to have friends and a faith community like ours. That's when it's handy to have a walking stick along to help you on your path. Unitarian Universalism, our religion, is that walking stick. It's not a religion that solves all of our problems. It's not a religion that can magically lift us over the muddy places. It's not a religion that spares us from having to dig deep and struggle when there's a big boulder we need to climb over or other challenges come along. But it is a religion that can help us keep our balance, that helps us keep our feet on the ground. A religion that reminds us when the going gets hard that each of us is strong, each of us is capable. However we identify our gender, our ethnicity, our race, whether we're big or little. And Unitarian Universalism is a faith that encourages each one of us to find our own beliefs. Not a one-size-fits-all religion, but one we constantly shape and reshape as individuals and as a faith community as we travel along. I have my own personal walking stick, but each of you can make your own stick. Just the right size and weight, the right thickness so that you can have a firm grip to help you go wherever you need to go on your unique journey. And together, as Unitarian Universalists, we can also create a religion we are proud to call our own and travel its path together. So be it. Children to classes with Go Now in Peace. We take it into our hearts away.
Now is the time in our service for the lighting of candles as we enter into the joys and sorrows that we share, as we enter into a moment of meditation and reflection. You're welcome to come forward from the sanctuary and come forth and light the candles that are at the table here. We will enjoy a moment of music and reflection as we do so. You're welcome to come forward and light the candles together. The Jewish scholar Abraham Heschel reminds us, The prayer cannot bring water to parched fields, nor mend a broken bridge, nor rebuild a ruined city, but prayer can water an arid soul, mend a broken heart, and rebuild a weakened will. I want to offer in this moment the prayers of the people. We send healing wishes to Sonia Gravat as she recovers at home from a recent surgery. We also send healing wishes to Jean Jost, who anticipates having a knee replacement this week. And we extend our care to her partner, Ken Kolb, as they navigate Jean's recovery. Ken is not able to join us in person at this time, and he dearly misses talking with folks at church. I want to invite us to offer calls and cards, maybe even a visit Those are all welcomed and encouraged. We also offer uh, healing wishes to El Cordonaway's grandma, Liddy, in Kansas City. Uh, She had a recent fall and surgery and will need rehab and support and prayers. All are much appreciated. In our larger world, We offer our witness and our care to Texas. The governor is attempting to harm transgender children and youth by criminalizing their care as trans people and calling that care abuse. All people deserve the care they need. All people are children of the world. Their care, our care, is what we need as human beings. We offer our witness to the people of Texas. Let me invite us into just a moment of quiet for reflection to hold all that is within our own hearts, all that is within our lives, all that is around us. There is so much within and without. Let us hold this moment in quiet together.
Amen. This morning, we are going to take an additional moment to acknowledge the way the imperialist mindset continues to threaten people and our precious planet. On Thursday, Russia attacked Ukraine. This act of aggression has and will continue to upset the balance of power in Europe and indeed have an impact on the whole world. I want to name, in part, that it can be particularly terrifying in the light of vague threats from Vladimir Putin about what he might do to the U.S. and to NATO if they try to stop him. And the Jewish community is also deeply concerned as well, given the anti-Semitic language used in Putin's campaign and the long history of pogroms against the Jews by the Russians. For those of us who lived through the Cold War, the duck and cover generation, those who still have nightmares watching the movie The Day After, or who cheered on Matthew Broderick in war games, this conflict can trigger all of our trauma buttons around nuclear war amid everything else that it includes. So I want to invite us to breathe into that moment or if deep breathing isn't right for you, choose something, a practice, an activity that helps you feel safe, supported, and, and known and in your body, here and now. It can feel like there's very little for us to do in this time. There are some things we can do, and you'll see those in the church posts after the service. But for this moment, this gathering and worship, we will light candles and we will pray together. Our first visual is from the Ukrainian village in Chicago asking people to pray for Ukraine. But I invite you into a moment of prayer and reflection with me. Spirit of life and love, Pervasive hope of peace, we add our voices to the chorus of those who align themselves with you. How could this be allowed to happen? When, oh when, will people learn to choose generosity over greed, compassion over aggression, creation over destruction? It is too much. It was too much the first time someone died for the sake of imperial ambition, and so very, very many have died. Our hearts go out to the people of Ukraine. Those wounded and killed, displaced, the dislocated, those lying awake, listening to the sounds of explosions, help them know they are not alone. We hold in our hearts as well the people of Russia, awaken their conscience, help them to know themselves as part of the human family, neither greater nor lesser. May they find the courage to stand up for what is right and just. May they be part of a global movement to hold their leaders accountable. And for our own minds, our own hands, our own bodies, we pledge once more to be the cause of peace, remembering that Lao Tse taught that peace between nations begins with peace in our hearts. Let us breathe in peace and love. Let us breathe out peace and love, and let us continue on together. Amen and amen. I want to offer this moment I don't know if there's going to be a vigil or some other forms of communal recognition and gathering, but in this moment, we can light candles together. Rosa will play Finlandia, also known as This Is My Song, and you are welcome to come forth and light more of the candles that we have prepared for this time. Let us enter into this musical reflection together.
For the closing blessing, I offer a prayer for Ukraine from Madam Pamita. I wanted to bring in something that had some goddess female power into this moment. So may these words ripple out all across all the lands on this day and in this day to come. I call upon the ancient Ukrainian goddess, Berahanya. I call upon the forest grandmother, Baba Yaga. I call upon the mother goddess, Mokash. I call upon the mother bear who protects her cubs. I call upon Madi Zemla, mother earth, mother of us all. And call upon all the mothers of spirits. That there may be peace and protection in the land of Ukraine that there is peace and protection for the people of Ukraine. So may it be. Blessed be. I invite you to rise and body your spirit for our hymn, Spirit of Life, in this moment. I invite you to take the spirit which is offered inside your heart and reflect on how that may be brought in and then sent out to the people of Ukraine. Let us enter into this hymn together. Please rise and body your spirit. When considering the, the weight of the world at the moment, I want to offer a story of imagination, of determination, even a little brashness and boldness and chutzpah. This is a story of when a small group of new and young ministers set out to reinvigorate an entire faith, and they succeeded. They asked questions. They pushed 
theological boundaries, and they also demanded more of themselves as well as demanding more of all of the people around them. As we live in this forming moment of religion and faith and social order and wonder what makes a difference, here, here is one story, one response to those existential and mortal questions from another great time in human history, in this case, from around the end of the Second World War. So let me give a little background here with ties that also comes to the here and now. In the first half of the 20th century, the Western world underwent major shakeups and traumas. You had World War I, you had the Great Flu Epidemic, the Great Depression, and World War II. And up into World War II, there had been a, a growing priority in evaluating on human ability, you know, kind of onward and upward, because our minds are just that fabulous. And there were lesser concerns about higher powers in some ways. Institutions were being shaken up a little bit as well, all kinds. And amidst this, Unitarianism as a faith and universalism as a faith were, were declining. And the universalism I'm talking about is that in the kind of traditional Christian sense that all are saved, uh, all are saved because Jesus died for everyone. So the one that's really grounded in our Christian practice. Universalism had been a growing faith in the 1800s, but as other Protestant traditions moved away from messages about the threat of hell and towards a more, you know, not always obvious, but a more universal salvation message. Universalism, the Universalist Church of America, lost um, the, the particular uniqueness of its message a little bit. And as I was doing the research on this as well, it sounds like there was just a lack of interest and concern uh, in forms of religion um, as well, whether it might be communion or formality of dress and robes and liturgy, the depth of meaning was kind of fading as well. But, but in 1945, there was this group of about nine, 10 young ministers, most of them recent graduates from the School of Religion in Tufts uh, in Medford, Massachusetts. And this group of universalist ministers called themselves the humiliati, meaning the humble ones, uh, which was taken from uh, the name of an ancient Italian monastic order. You have to have a little boldness to take on the name of humiliati, let me just say. Their primary mission they chose to accept was the revitalization of universalism. I mean, you know, 10 ministers saying, we're going to change all of universalism right now. But they had been seeing this loss of distinctiveness. They had been kind of lamenting with each other um, that, you know, they're like, we're called into this ministry, but our faith, what's going on with our faith? It seems to have lost its motivation and its energy and, and its own hope. Of course, one of the ironies of this is that they were actually, as much as they called themselves the humiliati, they were actually not known as terribly humble people, I'm going to say, just, just to be clear. And also to be clear, this is the time in universalist ministry when largely the ministry was of white men of Christian tradition. So this is, this is also where we come from. But they had sincere concerns. They were taking to heart their call into the world. So beginning in 1945, they had meetings that fostered fresh theological thinking and new rituals that did much to revise and renew universalism. And they developed a symbol, uh, a circle with an off-center cross. If you could see that in the graphic. We have a new trick today. Look what we can else do on the screen. 
And so that circle with the off-center cross, which also happens to be one of the symbols that belongs in this church as well. I found it in the supply closet. So the circle, let me tell you about this. The circle was representing a universal, with a little u, universal, universalism. That there here was an all-embracing religious tradition, a circle that was infinite and ongoing and expansive and would be entirely inclusive. The circle kind of represented all that is. And the cross, the cross certainly was coming from the Christian tradition of which we are a part. But the cross was off to the side, not in the center. And in doing so, in placing that cross off to the side, it, that was an intentional choice to recognize that we may be a lot of our tradition coming from and informed by Christian practice, but we are not the center. The Christian practice is not the center of all things. And in fact, there is a lot of room for all the other traditions that are around us. The Christianity is also no longer central to our particular universalist faith either. So here's the local connection. Here's the connection with this congregation. Clinton Lee Scott was a previous minister of this congregation in the 1930s. Um, but at the time, the humiliati came into formation. He was serving in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and he was a major supporter of theirs. And I have to imagine that somewhere along the line, some relationship somewhere resulted in this congregation also receiving and holding on to this off-center circle and cross, the symbol, what became the symbol, what the humiliati were trying to do in part was to create a distinctive symbol for universalism itself. Not just a cross, but something that was more expressive and more complete and more accurate. And so the circle and the off-center cross became the symbol of universalism. So they succeeded in that change in particular. So here's where they also did with their, they didn't just kind of stop at a symbol. They, they were on it. They were in it. They dove deeply into universalist theology, and they called it emergent universalism, which they described as functional, naturalistic, theistic, and humanistic. All the istics there. They really felt that one needed to focus on spiritual renewal before one could go out into, and really ground oneself particularly in spiritual um, reflection and renewal, theological discipline, before going out into the world. I mean, there's a point at which that's mutual, like you keep going in, you keep going out, but you really needed to get the theology going first. And it needed to be integrated into this life. What they also were coming from was a place of uh, what one of them called impulse theology. Some of their theology was based on one of the graduate papers as they prepared for ministry. They posited a hunger of every living thing, a spiritual hunger that would propel us toward wholeness. And they were stressing that we are impelled, not compelled in the relationship with God to fulfill the potential and the possibility of our lives. We are witnessing this impulse to wholeness in humanity, but certainly deeply flawed and troubled and chaotic at times as well. And so to kindle this spirit, to kindle this theology, they were focused on uh, new liturgical forms, emotional engagement, vestments, symbols, and they would broadcast their theology. They said like, we have a good thing and we're just going to send it to the entire universalist world, whether or not you know who we are. So they sent out newsletters, publications, um, external the theological documents. They also were visible in themselves. So this is kind of about a group of 10 or so young men, young ministers. They wore clerical collars, which was a little bit 
um, distinctive at the time, but they also wore those clerical collars all the time. Like they went deep. Like they were on board and committed. They called the leader that was the, um, the leader among them that would organize uh, and, and kind of call them, into, call them into discipline. They called that one the abbot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they called each other brother and used the formal names, like no nicknames. They had some pretty neat nicknames amongst each other, but no, they had to be called by their formal names. And they revised, they revised the theologies and the practices and really encouraged each other into deep discipline and then further exploration and discussion of theology and how to promote this into the world. They also showed up. Any universalist gathering of that time, there was somebody from the humiliati, further being active and engaged. They really lived into this. And I have to say, I read, they have a number of their papers and examples of their liturgical documents. And it was very theistic. And also, it was certainly based in God, but also uh, you could see clearly that Jesus was present, but Jesus as the most obedient servant of God, clearly not divine. It's significant, terribly significant, but not divine. So Unitarian in, in theology and Universalist in theology as well. And I read some of those sections of like the weddings and the communion and so on, and the depth of it, the language of it is material that I actually still could use today. They did great work. This is in 1945, 1954 or so. The impact was felt across, you know, was part of a whole other, you know, they were responding in some ways also to a movement of re-examining universalism. Robert Cummins, from an address to the Universalist General Assembly in the 1940s, explored some of the similar ideas, and he said, the universalism cannot be limited to Protestantism or to Christianity, not without denying its very name. Ours is a world fellowship, not a Christian sect. For so long as universalism is universalism and not partialism, the fellowship bearing its name must succeed in making it unmistakably clear that all are welcome, theist and humanist, Unitarian, Trinitarian, Black, White, people of color, a circumscribed, circumscribed universalism is unthinkable. And at the same time, in all of this work, I want to acknowledge that these young men, these humiliati, were also real human beings with families and commitments to church. They didn't always follow the order of the rules that they had imposed upon themselves. I read some of the um, existing papers. I mean, they truly had these higher level, elevated, transcendent conversations. And, and I could see in the abbot's writings to the, to the brethren, as they called themselves, um, notes and, and admonitions to say, you know, you took notes at that meeting. Can I have them? You all need to show up. You all need to let me know when you're showing up because I have to make reservations. It's like, oh yeah, right. They were doing deep work and still a bunch of humans, right? Still people, which was kind of nice to see, I have to say. This group didn't last forever. This is not one of those that kind of trailed off into the sunset after a long time. In about 1954, about nine years after they came into being, the humiliati officially disbanded, feeling that their mission had in fact been accomplished and that the Universalist Church of America and the American Unitarian Association, well, they were prepared to address the matter of merger that they completed and finished in 1961 with the creation of the Amer Unitarian Universalist Association. One of the great gifts of the humiliati was to be a major presence in helping universalism um, find a different path, not be so tied to the centrality of Christianity. And that let the Universalist Church be more open to what could happen, more able to adapt and evolve 
and able to finally have a conversation with the Unitarians and become a shared denomination, a new creature out of these two groups. But the humiliati also didn't just stop there. They went on to major leadership roles in Unitarianism and Universalism and Unitarian Universalism. They remained elders in our faith, and some of them truly living long enough to be cherished for several generations, including by ministers such as myself. They invited a whole faith to re-engage with contemplation, the meaning of religious ritual in the modern age, and how it can function in life, in the role of the minister, and how to make it less, less about the individual, but more about the body, more about how we are all connected together. I want to offer one of the ways that we've seen um, some of their legacy symbolically as well. One of the symbols, uh, one of the most common symbols in Unitarian Universalism, how that's been represented, is two circles, double, cir- a double set of circles with a chalice, a flaming chalice within it. If we could see that. There we go. Thank you. So the circles, one represents universalism, one represents Unitarianism. The flaming chalice um, is one that has the communion cup that is available to all to partake in the religious community. And the flame having many meanings, but one being the light of hope, the spark of life, but also a way that the world, a way to illuminate the world around us. So in the Unitarians, they had the chalice at the center of the circle, The Universalists had the off-center cross in the circle, and they brought them together to have the two circles with the chalice inside. One of those circles usually offset from having the chalice be offset from the center of the circle itself to continue with that meaning that we're not even putting our chalice at the center of all things either. Thank you. What I want to offer the story for today is part of our conversation about how we get to evolve. As I said earlier, we're at the forming edge of social movements of the world, of society, of faith, of mortality, of wondering what comes next. Recognizing that people have done this before and have gone on have gone on in care and love and able to transform a whole faith. Oh, let's be that ambitious, shall we? Ooh, dial me up. That there is so much possibility. You know, I realized that in looking back at the humiliati, some of the language that they were using at that time is language that I know I've already absorbed that I've already heard from other leaders that I've already received in the course of my life as a Unitarian Universalist and as a course of training as a minister. There is beauty and poetry. It's something mortal and transcendent all at once. They wanted a life. They wanted for all of us, these humiliati, a life of practice, a life of theological engagement. And they gave us a chance to do so and expand our vision of what religion and the institution could be. And then prepare to be ready to move into a new form. Continue to be open to service and to ministry, even when that particular experiment came to a close. I want to finish with one of the meditation from one of the best known and respected members of the Humiliati, the late Reverend Gordon McKeeman. He was one of those who was known by generations until his death in 2013. He remained active and present, showing up at General Assembly. I remember seeing him at the annual gatherings so early in my ministry as well. He was one of those who embodied that practice and our faith. So I want to close with one of his 
meditations. Ministry is a quality of relationship between and among human beings that beckons forth hidden possibilities, inviting people into deeper and more constant and more reverent relationship with the world and with one another, carrying forward a long heritage of hope and liberation that has dignified and informed the human venture over so many centuries, being present to, for, with others in their terrors and torments, in their grief and misery and pain, knowing that those feelings are our feelings too. Celebrating the triumphs of the human spirit, the miracles of birth and life, the wonders of devotion and sacrifice. Witnessing to life-enhancing values, speaking truth to power, standing for human dignity and equity, for compassion and aspiration. Believing in life in the presence of death, struggling with human responsibility against principalities and structures that ignore humaneness and become instruments of death. And all these, and much, much more than all of them, present in the wordless, the unspoken, the ineffable. It is speaking and living the highest that we know, living with the knowledge that is never as deep or as wide or as high as we wish. Whenever there is a meeting that summons us to our better selves, wherever our lostness is found, our fragments are united, our wounds begin healing, our spines stiffen, our muscles grow strong for the task, and there, there is ministry. May we be brave, compassionate, and fierce witnesses to each other and to the great tasks that live within us, around us, because of us, and that call us on. Let us go forth. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn it's from our own choir, Life Calls Us On.
Before I extinguish the chalice, I want to mention that we'll have the discussion about the sermon and about the service in Fellowship Hall right after. There is no coffee today, but next week. So things are moving along. But It Becomes More by Amy Zucker Morgenstern. When we take fire from our chalice, it does not become less. It becomes more. And so we extinguish our chalice, but we take its light and its warmth with us, multiplying their power by all of our lives and sharing it with the world. From the Reverend Karen Johnston. Do not be alone. Now gather together. Because gathering grows courage in ourselves and in others who see the numbers swelling. It is a small thing, but it is an important thing. Great wisdom sources remind us just because you cannot stem the tide of all the hate, it is still the right thing to do, the thing you can do. These things add up, your one thing and my one thing and this one and that one and theirs and ours and hers and this. Together, they become much larger. They become something big and wondrous. Do not be alone right now. Any liberation, all liberation is collective liberation. My freedom is bound with yours and yours and yours and is with mine, inextricably. So let us together cast our lots into doing the big things that we might maybe bend that moral arc of the universe toward justice. Don't be shy. We're up for the bending. Amen. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. Thank you.